The Rigel Black Chronicles, Book One, The Pure Blood Pretense. Chapter 14. Good morning, Professor Snape. Rigel froze with her spoon to her mouth as Pansy addressed the air over her head. She'd known this was coming and yet hadn't readied herself at all to face him. Good day, Miss Parkinson, Mr. Malfoy. There was a pause as he waited for Rigel to swivel in her seat. She set down her utensils and took the napkin from her lap. When she could delay no longer, she stood to face him. Mr. Black, are you prepared to leave directly? The careful neutrality was back, a layer of frosting so thick you couldn't see the way the cake had split in two underneath. Quite prepared, Professor. What's happening? Draco asked. He did so hate to be left out of things. Rigel flicked her eyes up to Snape's to see if she was allowed to tell them or not. He had seemed reluctant to accompany her initially, but it was he who had approached the breakfast table. She could easily have met him in his office if he didn't want people to know. Your housemate requires a new wand. I am escorting him to Ollivander's. Pansy gave Rigel a disappointed look. You've forgotten to tell us something important again, haven't you? Rigel began to apologise, but Snape was already striding for the entrance hall. I'll explain later, Rigel promised, hurrying after him. Behind her, she heard Draco say, No, he won't. Rigel caught up to Professor Snape in the entrance hall, and they set off without a word between them down the sloping lawn toward the main gate. She thought he would call a carriage at the gate, but Snape kept up his brisk stride down the path to Hogsmeade. Rigel didn't mind the walk, though she wished she'd grabbed her scarf. You didn't tell your friends. It was not a question, and Rigel wasn't sure what Snape wanted to know. Tentatively, she said, It's not that I don't trust them, just that I don't fully understand what's wrong with my magic myself, so explaining it seems... You avoid confrontation, even when the only thing you must confront is yourself. Also, not a question, with just enough truth to sting. Not everyone likes talking about themselves, she muttered. Snape shot her a look that said he saw right through her. She sincerely hoped he overestimated himself. Hogsmeade did humming business on the weekends. They wove their way into the three broomsticks with difficulty, and Snape indicated she should flu first. She had never liked the flu, the sheer counterintuition required to step into fire aside. The conveyance insisted on spitting her out instead of spinning her through with a gentle push, as everyone else apparently experienced it. Archie always said it was because she tasted like potion fumes. Rigel suspected the flu system simply knew she didn't like it. The leaky cauldron! At least when she was catapulted out the other end, she had the consolation of knowing Snape wasn't there to witness it. Tom, the cauldron's barkeep, did not hide his grin as he helped her up. Snape strolled through the flames as though he didn't even notice them, and Rigel had to assume everyone else was practicing their flu travel in secret. Snape glared a path through the throng of shoppers to Ollivander's dingy shop. It was the kind of small and dark that made her think it should have a plaque designating it a site of historical significance. There was really no other reason it shouldn't have been torn down and redeveloped. When they reached the door, Rigel turned resolutely to Snape. There's no need to come inside, Professor. If you wanted to go to Tate's Apothecary, I can join you as soon as I'm finished. I am not leaving you unattended in Diagon, Snape said dismissively, brushing past her into the store. Nothing for it, then. She would have to bluff like mad and hope she seemed more trustworthy than an old man in a dark shop. A bell rang, but the clapper was so dirty it sounded more like a metal thunk. The shop was packed with boxes, floor to ceiling, and then floor to ceiling again, double parked, and she thought it must be a fire hazard to have so much wood and dust in one place. Ollivander himself sat behind the small counter, whittling slowly at a length of birch. He set it aside and stood to greet them. 
don't get many young ones once term's begun. He spoke softly, his milky white eyes peering through the glue matter. No, not at her, she realised. He was looking at her hands for a wand. Snape held his wand out for Ollivander to examine, and the older wizard reached for it eagerly, as though greeting an old friend. Ah, yes, thirteen and one-half inches, ebony and dragon heartstring. Ollivander smiled at Snape knowingly. Non-conforming, good for combative magics, still well bonded, I see, Master Snape. He remembers the wand first and the person who bought it second. It serves me well. Snape confirmed. And yours? It had not occurred to her to be nervous about returning hers, but suddenly it felt as though she were returning a child to an orphanage. Ollivander looked so expectant that Rigel found herself pulling the ash wand from her pocket and holding it out to him. His gasp of dismay was audible. What have you... He touched the singed end of the wand, eyebrows drawn together in a bushy umbrella that forecasted thunder. Ash, twelve inches, and a hair from a particularly docile unicorn. I parted with this wand but a month ago. What have you done to it, Miss... Mr Black? Rigel spoke forcefully over him before he could finish what he'd been about to say. Merlin's beard, but she hadn't thought the old man would actually remember selling her the wand. Ollivander hesitated, tearing his eyes from the burnt wand to take in her Hogwarts robes and shorn haircut. Mr. Black, he spoke slowly, and his voice took on a fragile note that hadn't been there before. Forgive me, child, but I cannot recall. Snape shifted beside her, but Rigel dared not glance over to see what he made of the situation. Ollivander was playing along, and that was all that mattered at the moment. It's Rigel Black, remember? She smiled her way through the brazen lie. I came in with my cousin, Harry Potter. Harry got an elm wand with a unicorn hair as well. I had a bit of trouble finding one that worked, though. Ah, Ollivander nodded. That's why I don't recall. I didn't consider that wand sold, after all. Knew you'd be back, and here you are. She looked at the ash wand ruefully. You were right. This wand doesn't work for me. I should have listened when I was here before. You came back, that's what matters. She resolutely did not look at Snape. Ollivander slipped the ash wand into one of his many pockets. I'll be keeping this, lest you do any worse to it. Poor thing will need a clean overhaul before I can sell it on, but it won't have a bond holding it back, at least. She had no idea what that meant, so she nodded solemnly. I hope you cleared your afternoon. Ollivander hummed happily. This time I will find you a wand if it takes me all day. He sat Rigel down in a rickety chair and began to pull boxes, seemingly at random. Maple and unicorn hair, rather springy. Try... Oh, dear! The wand bucked in her hand the moment she grasped it, and a potted plant in the corner met an untimely end in an explosion of singed leaves. Ah, I'd forgotten how exuberant your magic is. Ollivander picked the maple wand off the floor with a determined smile. No matter, no matter. We'll have to proceed a bit differently, that's all. Professor Snape thinks that I've suppressed my magic, Rigel offered, glancing at the silent professor, who seemed content to watch from the sidelines. Will it even be possible for me to, er, uh, bond with a wand? I should think so. Ollivander scratched his white head of hair. It's true I prefer to narrow it down by reading a wizard's ambient magic, but even if your magic is tightly controlled, the right wand will sense it once it's in your hand. But there's no way to know without trying them all. Anxiety stirred in her gut. The potted plant had been enough to put her on edge, and she was starting to remember why she'd been so eager to get away last time. Causing a series of explosions wasn't the sort of thing that made a person want to lean into wand magic. No, you tried a great many last time, and I think it's safe to eliminate those, Ollivander said bracingly. How many does that leave Mr. Black to try? Snape asked, his voice tight. Oh, no more than six or seven hundred, Ollivander estimated. At Snape's dark-eyed stare, the older wizard seemed to reconsider. Unless, but I haven't used that in years. 
Rigel and Snape waited patiently for him to continue, and he did, after giving them a disappointed look that suggested he'd been hoping they'd to rise to the bait. There is a book I haven't needed since I was in training under my great-uncle. He puttered behind the counter and produced a book that had to have been bound in the early days of parchment-making. Yellowed with age, it gave a crotchety crack along the spine when Ollivander opened it. Rigel sneezed twice after inhaling what could only be the vaporised remains of a very old vampire that escaped the book as he blithely flipped the pages. "'It's a wand predictor,' Ollivander said significantly. He waited a beat for them to express their amazement, but Rigel was sneezing again. "'I've never seen one,' Snape offered diplomatically. She noticed he stayed as far back from the book-shaped urn as the cramped shop would allow. "'You wouldn't have!' Ollivander gave a proud sniff over the tome, and Rigel said a prayer for the coven that would never know what happened to their fallen comrade, invented by my ancestors, useful for wand-makers who cannot sense the resonance between wand and wizard for themselves. It won't pinpoint the exact wand, but it gives a good idea of where to start. He gestured Rigel forward. On the page he held open, she saw rows of thumbprints in brown ink with a wandwood and core noted next to each one. When Ollivander seized her hand and pricked her finger with the tip of a quill, it became evident what the ink was. She sort of doubted that quill was sanitary, but she reluctantly coated her thumb with enough blood to make a clear print. Within a minute, a word appeared beside her print. Holly. Ollivander hummed in approval. Just so, I might have suspected. Holly is a volatile wood, a dab hand at channeling impetuous emotions. It's also particularly protective. I dare say any holly wand that chooses you won't be so keen to give you up as the ash wand. He broke off as the next words appeared. Phoenix feather. Ollivander stared at the book for a long moment before raising his furrowed eyes to peer at her curiously. A rare combination... I was not expecting... He shot a hard-to-read look at Snape, then leaned closer across the counter as though his words were meant for her alone. A phoenix's allegiance is hard won. They are creatures capable of both great detachment and great initiative. Combining the aloof nature of the phoenix with the passionate nature of Holly usually results in disaster. As such, I'm afraid I have only one wand which fits these specifications. Ollivander shut the book and rummaged near the back of the shop. He returned with an underwhelming box that looked as though it had been languishing near a pile of mouse droppings for some time. Then Ollivander opened the box, and the hairs on the back of Rigel's neck stood straight up. Instead of taking the wand out and handing it to her, he simply held the open box out toward her. Holly and Phoenix feather, eleven inches, nice and supple. Go on and take it. She wasn't sure she wanted to. It felt as though fate herself was breathing over her shoulder, and Rigel had the sudden urge to back away and keep on backing up until she was out of the shop and down the street at the apothecary. Some competing instinct kept her rooted to the spot. It called to her, and all she could think was, oh, that's what it was supposed to feel like. She took the wand, more accurately, as her fingers wrapped around the wood, she thrummed at the wand, and the wand thrummed back. Sparks like scarlet plumage shot out of the end, and for a moment she could see the phoenix that gave its feather and hear its trill resonating in some echoing chamber deep inside her. It was like stepping into the rising sun. Bravo! Yes, well done! Ollivander's smile had an edge. How curious, he added as he took back the box. Since she had not yet humoured him and he had helped her find a better wand, Rigel prompted, What's curious? Ollivander looked her carefully in the eye. I do not usually care to guess what will become of my creations once they leave my shop. The destiny of a wand is tied too closely to that of its wizard, and the fates of men are as changeable as sand. But I cannot help but think this wand was meant for great things. Surely there's no way to know, she said weakly, attempting a smile. 
Ollivander didn't smile back. The phoenix whose feather resides in your wand gave another, just one other. I sold the first long before you were born, but this one has lingered, awaiting its equal. When two wands share such a connection at their core, spectacular things are known to happen. I do not know what this connection will mean for you, but I am curious to see if you ever find your wand's brother. Rigel wasn't sure what to say to that, so she thanked Ollivander politely and pulled out her meagre pin money. Ollivander declined payment, citing the ash wand returned unbonded, so she pocketed the holly wand and followed Snape out of the shop. They didn't speak on the way back to school, but she caught Snape glancing at her sidelong more than once. Rigel did want to do great things, but not with a wand in her hand. She was grateful the holly wand had chosen her, but now she worried it might be disappointed. She felt like she'd walked out of the shop with the wand equivalent of a Nimbus 2000 and no intention of ever playing Quidditch. Couldn't he have talked her into a more basic model? It was the only Holly and Phoenix wand he had, she reminded herself. Maybe it was too much wand for her if he expected her to become some sort of charms master with it, but they would get on well enough. It hadn't exploded anything yet and it had been almost a whole hour. Great things would come or they wouldn't. The best she could do was focus on the present. She had more than enough to be getting on with. Her new wand was brilliant, but a little too eager. She had no problem casting spells with it. She just wished it would stop there. The holly wand was like a firework that occasionally lit its own fuse. She could swear sometimes it started performing a spell before she had even finished the incantation and wand movement. Other times, a spell came out magnified beyond her intentions. At first, Draco and Pansy were delighted for her, but after she exploded the training dummy she was supposed to be stunning in Dada, even her friends admitted she needed to dial it back a little, only she didn't know how. She was holding a fireman hose, and the teachers kept telling her to gently water the flowers. There was no gentle, controlled way to use the holly wand. Once she picked it up, it could pull whatever magic it wanted out of her, and Rigel was supposed to be grateful it worked at all. When she asked Snape about her wand's enthusiasm, he theorised it may be siphoning off the built-up energy in her magical core whenever it could. His suggestion was to simply do more magic with it. Rigel wasn't so sure. The ash wand not doing what she willed it to had been annoying, but there was something downright unsettling about the holly wand doing not only what she willed, but also whatever else it wanted. Still, the look on McGonagall's face when Rigel performed her first perfect transfiguration in front of her was worth any excess zeal on the part of her wand. She was no longer in danger of failing her classes, which meant her goal of remaining at Hogwarts had been inarguably fulfilled. Really, Rigel thought as she jogged through the dungeons on her way to the Halloween feast, she shouldn't complain. She was running late that evening, having been caught up in an essay on ward theory for Flint, but she was sure her friends had saved her a seat. It was a simple thing, but she thought always having a seat might be what friendship had been created for in the first place. On her way up the stairs to the entrance hall, she heard the first explosion. Rigel had pressed herself to the side of the stairway before she heard the follow-up crackles and pops and saw the multicolour lights spilling out the open doors to the great hall. Fireworks, she muttered, calming her racing heart bit bold to set them off indoors, but she supposed the ceilings in the Great Hall might be tall enough. As she reached the main floor, the Weasley twins came darting out of the feast. Their expressions were backlit by the colourful firecrackers still going off in the hall behind them, and they didn't look cheered. Fred! George! Rigel had to call out, or they would have barreled right by her. Rigel! George swung around. His face was caught between friendliness and consternation. It made him look a bit ill. You're doing? she asked, indicating the fizzling fireworks. The twins exchanged a dark glance. No, Fred said shortly. Look, sorry, but we've got to run. See you, and watch yourself, George added, dragging his twin away up the stairs. That was odd. 
She had thought they'd been avoiding her the last few weeks, but now she was near sure of it. Perhaps she had offended them by spending so much time with Percy. But his help was invaluable. She wouldn't give it up over a bit of brotherly jealousy. There was an empty place between Pansy and Blaise Zabini that might as well have had Rigel's name stamped into it. She gave Pansy an appreciative grin as she slid into the bench and nodded to Draco, who sat across from her. "'Sorry I'm late,' she offered. "'I was in the library,' Pansy finished. "'We figured.' Rigel looked up and down the table, in awe at the extent of the decorations. There were towers of cupcakes, candy sculptures, mountains of playfully themed food. Their table had a giant spider made entirely of asparagus, and everyone's goblets smoked spookily with green vapours. "'Did you see the fireworks?' Draco asked. "'Just missed them,' Rigel admitted. "'Who set them off?' "'No one knows.' Theo leaned around Pansy to speculate excitedly. A whole slew of them were planted in the Hufflepuff jack-o'-lanterns, exploded bits of pumpkin all over the poor duffers when they went off. Rigel craned her neck to see the Hufflepuff table over Draco's shoulder at the far end of the hall. She bit her lip to keep from laughing. It wasn't really funny to scare people like that, but it did look like their table had fought a battle against Squash Army and lost. What did the professors do? Contained them! Theo slapped the table in his excitement. Pansy gave up eating and simply leaned back politely while Theo filled Rigel in. Soon as the first one went off, Dumbledore was there with his wand, and a wicked shield came up around it so none of the students got burned. He shielded all of them, only he left the shields clear so we could still see the colours. Sprout is steaming, Millicent added, indicating the high table. None of the professors looked particularly happy, but Sprout, in particular, was glaring about the hall. "'Doesn't like her precious puffs being picked on,' Draco noted. "'It is odd,' Rigel agreed. "'Pranks on Halloween aren't odd,' Theo argued. "'I hear there's always at least one.' "'It's odd that Hufflepuff would be targeted,' Rigel clarified. "'Gryffindor and Slytherin are still in the middle of a prank war, aren't they?' It's died down a bit, but you're not wrong, Pansy said thoughtfully. They must have really annoyed someone, Theo said, shrugging. He turned back to his food, and Pansy allowed herself to continue her own meal with a serene patience that made Rigel wonder if she'd been a saint in another life. The food was excellent, but Rigel was hard-pressed to find anything that wasn't covered in sugar. She reached for the smoking goblet by her plate, hoping it wasn't pumpkin juice. The goblet was halfway to Rigel's lips when someone screamed behind her, and a hand knocked the cup violently from her grasp. It sloshed as it clanged to the table, splashing her right hand and arm. The liquid burned where it hit her bare skin, and all she could think as she cried out in pain was, that is not pumpkin juice. She leapt off the bench, shouting, "'Stay away from it!' Rigel hauled Pansy out of her seat with her left hand and pushed the girl behind her toward the Gryffindor table. Blaze had scrambled back as soon as the goblet fell, and Draco was dragging Millicent away on the other side of the table. Rigel thanked Merlin the tables had been widened to accommodate the extra food for the feast, or Draco would have gotten a lapful of it. As it was, only Rigel got hurt, but gods it hurt. Her robes were smoking where the contents of the goblet had landed, and she heard Pansy demand a pitcher of water from the Gryffindor table as she focused on breathing in and out, in and out. Cool water splashed in a blessed stream over her hand. Rigel closed her eyes as the burning pain receded for a moment, and she could think. Why the hell had there been acid in her water goblet? Pansy had a second pitcher pouring slowly over Rigel's arm, trying to prolong the relief, when Snape waded through the mob of panicking students to their table. Move aside, move aside, he growled, carving a path for the teachers with a combination of efficient magic and menacing glares. Gryffindors and Slytherins alike scrambled to get out of his way, but it wasn't easy. 
The widened house tables meant the aisles between them were narrower than usual. Plus, everyone wanted to see what was going on. The potions master took quick stock of the situation when he reached them. With cool efficiency, he severed Rigel's sleeve at the shoulder and vanished it. Her arm looked like a candy cane, striped with patches of burning red. Madame Pumphrey was right behind Snape, and she pulled out her wand with a frightfully focused stare. Rigel had no time to panic before the matronly woman cast an aguamenti, and then she was feeling too grateful to do anything but sag with relief. "'You'll be all right, Mr. Black,' the healer assured her briskly. "'Just an acid burn.' Rigel could only nod and pray. The superficiality of the wound made deeper or more general health scans entirely unnecessary. Snape stiffened at the word acid and swept his gaze over the Slytherin table. It was in his goblet, Theo said loudly. Rigel felt herself go a bit faint when she considered how close she had been to drinking it. Draco had come around the table to help, and he quickly braced her at the shoulder so she didn't sway like a ninny. She gave him a quick... Thanks. Draco didn't answer, so she tore her gaze away from her burning hand and searched his thunderous expression. It was aimed at Blaze, no, at the blonde girl Blaze was holding by the elbow. It was Hannah Abbott. She looked miserable, crying and shaking, her pigtails askew. Rigel frowned at Blaze, who gave her one of his odd smiles. What shall I do with your blonde butterfly? Seems to be discontent with merely watching you. The girl flushed deeply and she shivered. Blonde butterfly. Rigel shook her head in confusion. Abbott, you're the one that's been following me. Following you? Snape repeated dangerously. She's the one that knocked the acid onto your arm, Draco growled. Abbott shook her head fiercely. I didn't mean to. We saw you dive for the goblet, Draco hissed. You were running right for him. I was trying to stop him from drinking it. Abbott looked to Rigel imploringly, unshed tears caught in her lashes. I thought I was too late when I saw you lift it, and I panicked. I'm sorry, I didn't know it would burn you. I just knew you couldn't drink it. Pumphrey had her wand working over Rigel's arm in soothing patterns, and she could already feel the burn receding. Thanks, Abbott, she said faintly. Thanks, Draco repeated in her ear, disbelieving. I'm glad I didn't drink it. Rigel eyed the fallen goblet, which the elves, wearing thick protective gloves and face masks, had just popped in to contain. Snape loomed over the Hufflepuff girl, eyes menacing. You claim not to have known it was acid, but you did know his cup had been tampered with in the first place. How is that, Miss Abbott? Her chin wobbled at the black look on Snape's face, but she choked out. I overheard it. I left the feast to go to the bathroom, and I heard someone say Rigel's name. Black, I mean. Pansy caught Rigel's eye, and the absurd thought that she would have to explain why Abbott was using her first name made her want to laugh and cry at the same time. So you went to investigate? Snape did not seem to believe her. It... they... Abbott looked one sniffle from falling to pieces. It wasn't in a nice way, you know. It was a b-boy, I think, and he said it so meanly, and I, I just... Rigel took pity on her. It was clear the girl didn't want to get into why she'd gone to investigate at the sound of her name, but if she hadn't, Rigel might be laid out in the hospital wing with a hole through her esophagus. What else did they say? she asked gently. Abbott's eyes filled with tears once more. He said he'd gotten a tea tablet into your drink, and then he laughed, and he was thanking someone for setting off the f f fireworks. Every Slytherin in hearing went still, including their head of house. It was a distraction, Pansy said quietly. Her eyes flashed to the Hufflepuff table on the far side of the hall. The Ravenclaw table was next to it. Then the Slytherin table which meant the table everyone was looking away from at that moment was... Gryffindors! Theo snarled. The members of Godric's house looked among themselves, eyes wide. No one could deny it made sense, but Rigel could see even they didn't know who would do something so utterly disturbing. 
A prank war was one thing. Attempted murder was quite another. I ran back in as fast as I could, Abbott promised. Her wide eyes bored into Rigel's. Please, right? Please, Black. I just thought it was poisoned or something. I didn't mean to hurt you. I believe you, Rigel said firmly. Draco muttered something under his breath, but it wasn't his forgiveness to give. Blaze released Abbott at once, even straightening her over robe with an apologetic nod. Rigel indicated her arm, which Pumphrey had just finished bandaging. No lasting damage, and you saved me a much more serious injury. I am in your debt. N no Abbott rushed to say, shoulders slumping. I should have been faster. Snape gave the Hufflepuff a baleful glare that made the girl straighten fearfully. If I find out you're lying about this incident, Miss Abbott, you will rue the day you got your Hogwarts acceptance letter. As it is, he took a deep, fortifying breath. Ten points to Hufflepuff. The hall gaped in silence, and Rigel was sure she saw Snape's lips twitch ever so slightly upward as he swept from the room. Abbott's housemates descended to collect her, wrapping her in admiration for her heroic deed and generally bearing a put-upon demeanour that suggested they were the real victims in all this. Rigel blew out a breath. I'm heading back to the common room. You guys enjoy the feast. No chance. Draco flared his nostrils like an offended stallion. She wondered if he'd picked that up from his godfather. You're not going anywhere alone. Someone just tried to kill you. Draco caught her left arm and dragged it over his shoulder in a blatant show of support. Pansy set her hand on Rigel's right elbow, above the bandages. The two of them escorted her proudly and defiantly out of the hall. Rigel tried not to meet anyone's eyes, but it was impossible with the whole hall staring at her. Rosier and Rookwood nodded from further down the table. Ron and Neville followed her with worried looks as she passed the Gryffindors, and Percy said confidently, We'll find whoever did this, Black. Make no mistake. Rigel tried to smile, but her eyes wandered the table and the smile fell away. The Weasley twins, usually so easy to pick out of a crowd, were nowhere to be seen. They hadn't come back to the feast. In the common room, Draco and Rigel collapsed on a low-backed couch, and Pansy sat only for a moment before standing once more and making for her room. She'll be back, Draco said. She just needs something to do with her hands. Sure enough, Pansy returned carrying a tea tray with a tin of her grandmother's biscuits levitating shakily behind her. Mm -hmm. Pansy set to making tea, and Draco started in on the disaster of a night. Who would even do something so, so? Draco kicked the chair next to him in frustration when words failed. I don't know, Rigel said quietly. You've offended no one. Kept to yourself. Pansy shook her head, eyes on the tea leaves she was measuring. It doesn't make sense. You've been up to the Gryffindor Tower a bunch times, Draco said. Oh, come on, he added, when Rigel stared at him. We know you aren't always in the library. People talk. I just mean, has anyone been rude to you? Did you upset anyone there? The only one I talk to is Percy and the Weasley twins, she added. Sometimes Ron and Neville, that's really it. What are you talking to Percy Weasley for? Draco scrunched his nose. He helps me with magical theory sometimes. It doesn't matter, Pansy said at the same time. A prefect wouldn't be involved in something like this. Those twins might, Draco said. We don't know it was a Gryffindor, Rigel tried. Oh, come off it, Draco kicked the chair again. Don't defend them. Someone wanted us all to be looking away from their table when it happened. They had a clear line of sight to your empty seat. Could have levitated it right in while the fireworks were going off. Pansy's hand shook on the teapot. I can't believe I didn't notice, but all the goblets were smoking. They waited for Halloween on purpose, Rigel said tiredly. If it was a Hufflepuff, Abbott should have recognised their voice, Pansy said. But how could they have planted the fireworks without a Hufflepuff's help? 
an accomplice? Abbott said they were thanking someone for that bit, assuming they weren't talking to themselves, Draco added darkly. Maybe the accomplice didn't know how serious the prank was going to be, Rigel suggested. Imagining that two people at school wanted to seriously injure her was difficult. Well, they won't come forward now, then. The whole school's going to be in inquisition mode, Draco said. Even some of the Gryffindors looked furious. I bet if they find out who did it first, they'll turn them in right off. No loyalty among the Griffins. Not for stuff like this. Pansy passed Rigel her cup. Do you think it was the Weasley twins? She asked bluntly. Rigel looked into the cup, reluctant to answer. I don't want it to be. I like them. But they were leaving the hall just as the fireworks went off. Those fireworks are a Zonko's product, Draco said. And weren't you hit with a dung bomb and a smoke bomb that night in the dungeons? Rigel nodded. She would not deny that a pranking tool had been at work in each of her attacks. Anyone can buy those products, though. The same cannot be said for a tablet of acid, Pansy said sharply. This is no schoolyard prank. Actually, Draco frowned, thinking hard. My father said something about tablets over the summer. The ministry was running an inquiry. I don't remember. Blaze. Blaze was crossing the common room with Millicent and Theo. All three of them came over, and Pansy set out additional cups. This summer, there was something about tablets being recalled due to a ministry inquiry. Did you hear anything about it? Blaze shook his head, but Millicent leaned forward and said, The Zonko's tablets, yes. I thought that's what it might be, too. What tablets? Pansy prompted. It was a product Zonko's launched in July, Millicent explained. But by August, they'd pulled them all. It was supposed to be some kind of state-changing thing. You slip it in your friend's drink, the liquid turns solid and won't come out. Everyone laughs. Plebeian, Draco rolled his eyes. And poorly engineered, Millicent said. The runes along the edge of the tablets turned out to be easy to modify. Change one, and instead of turning your drink solid, it'll turn it poisonous or corrosive. They had at least one murder and two hospitalizations within a month, and the Ministry pulled the plug, crashed the joke market because this isn't the first issue with a Zonko's product this year. My cousin lost a lot of coin. It, they may have stopped selling them, but some must still be out there. Theo drummed his fingers on his chair, and someone would have to deliberately change the runes to make the tablet do that to your drink, Blaze pointed out. This wasn't an accident. Thanks, Salazar, you didn't drink it. Pansy bit decisively into a biscuit and chewed it with Machiavellian purpose. I'm sending Abbott flowers. And we're going to figure out who's doing this, Draco promised. If Dumbledore doesn't expel them, they'll wish he had. It can't go unanswered. My father would be furious to know this kind of violence is happening at the school. Don't tell him! Rigel begged. None of you! I don't need it getting back to my family that I'm being attacked. They'll pull me from school. Everyone exchanged a reluctant look before promising to at least downplay it if they couldn't avoid mentioning it altogether. She supposed that was as good as it got in Slytherin. In the meantime, try to spend less time in Gryffindor Tower, Pansy advised. Rigel hesitated. She didn't want to think someone she knew in Gryffindor was behind this, but it made sense not to push her luck. All right, she said softly, just until the person who did this is uncovered. Their talk turned to other things, like the upcoming Quidditch match. Draco wouldn't be playing unless something dreadful happened to Higgs. But he managed to look forward to watching the match with the other reserve players, with as much, if not more, enthusiasm. More than one older student stopped by their couch on the way in from the feast. They promised to avenge her, not seeming to hear her, when she told them she didn't think a renewed prank war was going to help. Pansy advised her to let them do what they wanted. Everyone felt helpless, and more than a little outraged that a first year had been so viciously and publicly attacked. 
It would do them good to have an outlet, Pansy said. If that outlet needed to be a war of cunning and surprise in her name, then so be it. In the name of Black. As one, the first years ducked under the bench. A paint bomb went off all over the Gryffindor third years, and McGonagall's voice could be heard screeching the resulting loss of points over general chaos. No one seemed to hear her or care about the points at all. Rigel climbed back to her breakfast with the others, inspecting her scone for any rogue drops of paint. That's the third one this morning, Pansy said, straightening her robes. Honestly. Something, something. People need an outlet, Rigel muttered. The blonde girl shot her an unimpressed look. Obviously, I didn't know it was going to go this far. The first week of November had been chaos. The Slytherins launched a no-quarter campaign against Gryffindor House, and the Lions, partly in self-defence and partly for the sheer blood of it all, retaliated in kind. Not a meal passed without disturbance. McGonagall and Snape could barely keep a semblance of order between them, and even Dumbledore was starting to look worried as the week progressed. The situation was not helped by the looming Quidditch season. Anticipation ran high the week before the first match, and players from both teams were targeted in hopes of winning an edge by Saturday. Draco should have been relatively safe, being both a first-year and only a reserve player, but someone had left a huge tarantula in his book bag on Wednesday, and it gave him a nasty bite when he reached in for his charms textbook. Luckily, Draco wasn't allergic, and a trip to the hospital wing saw him good as new, but the incident had them all paying closer attention to their belongings. The morning of the match, it was all but a three-ringed circus. Pansy had helped Rigel dress again, this time in robes of dark grey with emerald embroidery along the cuffs and a deceptively delicate scarf of the same green, which turned out to be quite warm. She'd certainly need it up in the teacher's box. Pansy herself wore robes of forest green with silver trim and a black cashmere scarf that made her golden blonde hair shine brilliantly. Do you think there'll be any pranks at the match? Theo asked. Draco shot him a scandalised look. They wouldn't dare! It's Quidditch! His logic was unassailable, but Pansy took an unconvinced sip of tea. I certainly hope no one embarrasses themselves while the Board of Governors is present. Do all of them come to every match? Millicent asked. No, but they all come to the first match, Draco said. He turned to Rigel. Are you looking forward to meeting my parents? Well... There was really only one answer to that. Yes. At Pansy's prompting eyebrow raise, Rigel added, What, um, should I know about them before we meet? Draco sat straighter in his seat at the question. Well, father is very proper in mixed company. Don't be offended if he's overly formal. Mother will probably be a bit friendlier because she'll see you as family, and she already likes Pansy enough to suggest marriage on three separate occasions. Pansy smiled brightly. I adore your mother, but we both know she hasn't started considering matches for you yet. Pansy turned to Rigel and added, She has the most marvellous tea sets. I don't think I've ever seen the same one twice. Draco gave a long-suffering sigh. Whatever you do, don't mention politics or father's work in this O.W. party. He loves Quidditch, and he hates to have his leisure time interrupted with work. That should be easy enough. Pansy said. I doubt Rigel is eager to converse on such subjects with the Malfoy patriarch. I'd be entirely out of my depth, Rigel admitted. Everyone is out of their depth when it comes to father, Draco said proudly. That's what makes him a Malfoy. Rigel and Pansy laughed, and Flint finally stood and signalled his team. Wood shot up immediately from the next table over and rallied his own troops for action. Draco stood and graciously accepted everyone's luck and well wishes, none of them daring to acknowledge that he wouldn't actually be playing. He followed his team, and Pansy took a moment to smooth the wrinkles from Rigel's robes, shifting a few stray locks back into place. Rigel offered Pansy her arm, a habit she was finding less uncomfortable as she got used to it, and the two of them made their way slowly down the lawn. 
The teacher's box was worth the climb, with wide rows and a sturdy railing that jutted out over the pitch. There was room to mingle congenially, as Pansy put it, on one side of the box, and the shimmer of magic over each bench seat suggested comfort charms and possibly even warming charms awaited. Most of the professors and a lot of adults Rigel didn't recognise were present when they arrived, and more than a few raised eyebrows as Pansy breezed into the box as if she owned it. Mr Malfoy was already there as well, unless some other man in the wizarding world looked as though he'd cloned himself in Draco rather than merely fathering him. He and his wife sat next to Snape in the second row. They were dressed to match in striking silver, and their hair did, as Pansy professed, appear to hold the light itself captive in its strands. Mrs Malfoy spotted Pansy and made to stand. Her husband rose instantly, Professor Snape a beat behind. Both men turned to see who had garnered her attention, and Rigel, coward that she was, chose to meet Snape's raised eyebrow rather than see whatever expression crossed Mr Malfoy's face first. My dear, you look lovely. The beautiful lady stepped around the men to give Pansy a willowy embrace. She had the features of an alpine lake, crisp and remote. So wonderful to see you, Narcissa. Thank you for your kind invitation. Pansy's smile could have charmed a small country out of its woodlands. She dipped a curtsy and added, "'It's been too long, Lord Malfoy. I hope the day finds you well.' "'Pansy, I see formal schooling has not robbed you of your natural charm.' "'Mr. Lord?' Malfoy inclined his head with regal fondness. His voice was as elegant as his silver-tipped serpent cane, and, Rigel suspected, just as deadly when called upon. "'Your father is well, I trust.' "'Quite well, thank you.' Malfoy's strong jaw flexed as he nodded, and it added to the impression of strength and power that he seemed to project without noticing. But of course he did notice. Rigel was sure he depended upon it. Pansy turned to Snape and dipped a shallow curtsy for him as well. Good day, Professor Snape. Indeed, Miss Parkinson. Snape gave a short nod, but his dark eyes swept the box restlessly. "'And who is your patient escort today, Pansy?' Mrs Malfoy asked, a friendly smile playing at the edges of her mouth. Pansy turned her shoulders at an angle to indicate Rigel to the three adults. "'Lord and Lady Malfoy, may I introduce to you Rigel Black? Rigel is a dear friend to me and to your son. Rigel, this is Draco's mother, Lady Narcissa Malfoy, and his father, Lord Lucius Malfoy.' "'A pleasure to make your acquaintance at last, Mr Black.' Mrs Malfoy held out a delicate hand, and Rigel bowed over it respectfully, though she didn't kiss it in deference to the lady's husband. Pansy had been very clear on that. "'Likewise, fair lady,' Rigel raised her head, "'though I fear the tales of your grace and beauty are woefully inadequate. Never in my life have I known elegance until this moment.' Mrs Malfoy's smile bloomed like a rose careful and refined. I would not have thought it possible, but you are even more charming than your father, Mr. Black. Please call me Rigel, Lady Malfoy. I could not bear to be mistaken for my father in the eyes of such a queen. Rigel let the light catch her eyes. She distinctly heard Snape snort. Mrs. Malfoy's laugh was delicate, practised. Very well, Rigel, then to you I must be Narcissa. As you wish, my lady, Rigel said. She turned to Mr. Malfoy, schooling her features into the kind of pleasant engagement that didn't reveal any feelings. I am honoured to be making your acquaintance, Lord Malfoy. And didn't it feel strange to call him that? She knew in a vague sense that her father was technically a lord too, but people didn't go around calling him that. It was Aura Potter, or just Potter. She felt as though she'd stepped into a Regency novel, but she didn't want to embarrass Pansy. The pleasure is mine, Mr Black. Malfoy inclined his proud head as she bowed deeply before him. Draco has told us much about you. Draco has far too good an opinion of me, so I can only hope our meeting does not pale in comparison to your expectations, Rigel said, allowing warmth to crease her eyes as she spoke of her friend. I am not in the habit of forming inflexible expectations of people, Malfoy said, 
particularly not on the word of my son. It seems as though at least some of the things Draco hinted at are true, however, Narcissa commented. Her gaze flicked playfully to Pansy. I will certainly be warning the mothers in my tea circle to mind their daughters around you, Mr. Black. Rigel affected a look of distress. Pansy, dear friend, put paid to this cruel inference. Pansy sent her a knowing smile, saying airily, Alas, I would, if only the trail of broken hearts did not speak so condemningly for itself. Rigel turned to Snape, risking his notoriously thin sense of humour to include him in the conversation. Professor, you aren't going to allow them to malign my good name, are you? Snape looked down his nose at her, eyes glittering. Your name is blackened beyond repair. However, he tilted his head consideringly. It is difficult to credence you have the time to build such a reputation when one considers the amount of work I assign you. Mr. Malfoy turned surprised eyes on his friend. The hint of amusement tempered his otherwise cold and formal demeanour. Now Rigel could sort of see why Draco liked this man so much. I never thought I'd see the day when Severus Snape admits to the inordinate demands he makes of his students. And you never shall, Snape rejoined. I am, if anything, too easy on most of my students. Pansy shot Rigel a meaningful look, and it took her a moment to realise what was happening as Snape continued. But Mr. Black is not most students... Snape indicated Rigel with a jut of his chin, and it was all Rigel could do not to beam with gratification. I admit my expectations for him are higher, but the demands I make of him are embarrassingly easily met, if the speed with which he completes my tasks are any indication. Professor Snape was backing her in front of the Malfoy patriarch, and he even sounded like he meant it. Rigel fought a blush as the Malfoys turned appraising eyes on her. Just then, Professor Quirrell broke in abruptly from the row behind them. "'Lord Malfoy, so good of you to come watch our little game,' he said, a tad too loudly. His voice was so oily he might have been trying to ooze his way into the aisle. "'Ah!' Mr. Malfoy turned his head alone toward Quirrell and gave a slow nod, though the thin man didn't remember to bow back. "'Professor Quirrell, good day.' Yes, indeed, if you like this sort of thing. Quirrell waved a hand at the Quidditch pitch as though gesturing to an especially odious display of frivolity. I was wondering, Lord Malfoy, how the progress on that new bill is coming. You know the one? Yes, I do. Mr Malfoy pressed his lips together and cast swift eyes over to where Dumbledore was chatting amiably with Professors McGonagall and Sprout. He turned fully to face Quirrell and said in a low, tight voice, "'That particular issue is still in the working. It likely will not proceed apace for some time due to certain immovable objects which, at present, stand in the way.' Quirrell looked quite disappointed. "'Hmm, what a shame. I had hoped to see the changes wrought within the year, you know. I have my eye on—' "'Fortunately, this matter was not contrived for your convenience, Professor Quirrell.' Malfoy was clearly annoyed with the topic, and Rigel thought Quirrell must be especially dense to bring up what was obviously a sensitive subject in mixed company, company including Albus Dumbledore, leader of the opposition to the SOW party, who would surely be interested in whatever bill they were talking about. It will move forward when the climate is more appropriate. Now, if you will excuse me, I believe the match is starting soon. Mr. Malfoy turned pointedly away from Quirrell, and Rigel caught the look of disdain on his face before he smoothed it. "'My apologies for interrupting our conversation,' he said. "'It seems I am unable to escape my work, even at my own son's Quidditch match.' Narcissa placed a gentle hand on her husband's arm. He immediately clasped it in his and gave her a look that likely only she would understand. "'Not at all, Lord Malfoy.' Pansy demurred. I believe you were correct in any case. The match is about to start. Far below them, Madame Hooch was striding onto the pitch. Rigel pressed Pansy's hand into her elbow once more, though she was only escorting her another few feet, and said, 
I very much enjoyed our meeting, Lady Malfoy, Lord Malfoy. I am certain it will not be our last, Narcissa said, moving aside with her husband, to allow Rigel and Pansy access to their seats. I hope you enjoy the game, Professor Snape, Rigel said as she manoeuvred Pansy around the Malfoys. She tried to convey in her expression just how grateful she was for his support. I enjoy watching Slytherins win, Snape said. Rigel noticed McGonagall throw her colleague an unsportsmanlike look behind his back. They settled in to watch the game, and it became immediately apparent that the scales were tipped decidedly in Gryffindor's favour. The Slytherin team had practised hard. It showed in their smooth coordination and aggressive plays, but no matter how they manoeuvred, the Gryffindor chasers were simply better. They flew as though they had open telepathic connections with the kind of teamwork that wasn't a rehearsal of drills, but a perfect mutual understanding. It made them flexible, and their improvisation and split-second adaptations to any manoeuvre the Slytherin team pulled seemed likely to win the day. If the Gryffindor chasers were telepathic, the Weasley twins were clairvoyant. They seemed to completely anticipate the bludgers' movements, for whenever a bludger veered one way, one of the twins was there to steer it somewhere else. The Slytherin beaters were relegated to defending their own players, not a chance for offensive tactics with the Weasleys monopolising the bludgers so effectively. But while Gryffindor racked up a 70-point lead in the next 45 minutes, it was the Slytherin seeker who spotted the snitch first, and it was clear to everyone when the Gryffindor seeker tried belatedly to follow that he was no match for Higgs. Rigel shared a grin with Pansy when Higgs began to dive, and she noticed with surprise that Mr. Malfoy had leaned forward in his seat. Face was rapt with attention as his grey eyes followed the darting snitch. It was the same intensely focused look Draco affected when he was excited about something, but knew better than to show it. When Higgs caught the snitch, Malfoy's riveted expression creased into a single satisfied smirk that disappeared as he stood. But it made Rigel feel better about the aloof aristocrat to know he could be engaged by something as benign as a school Quidditch match. As the stands cleared, Rigel and Pansy politely thanked their hosts and said their goodbyes. Give my regards to your father, Rigel, Narcissa said. Her beautiful face betrayed no discomfort in acknowledging her estranged cousin. I will, my lady, though it will be cruel of me to make him so jealous of my good fortune in meeting you. Rigel pulled out one last smile for her friend's parents, though it felt like her cheek muscles had all but had it. Narcissa laughed delightedly as they left, and Rigel couldn't help but be pleased at how well she'd done in playing Archie. She was charming and proper, which was all anyone could ask of a pure blood at their age. Expectations met. She felt no guilt in enjoying the rest of the day with Draco, who was flushed with exultation at Slytherin's victory and eager to regale them both with his opinion on every play he deemed interesting enough to dissect. Rigel mused that even the scariest people and social experiences could be broken down like Quidditch plays, in a way. The key was to take each manoeuvre at a time, without forgetting how they all fit together. Really, she didn't know what Archie had been so worried about. Being a pureblood wasn't exactly hard. We hope you enjoyed this chapter. Please consider supporting our project by joining our Patreon linked in the description or become a member here on YouTube, where you will get access to several additional chapters weeks before they release on YouTube.